Um, we wanted to kick it off with a little tribute to the Linux, right? Everyone knows Linux. It's so large, so huge, and 30 years old as of last year. But last year there was no conference to celebrate it. So we wanted to celebrate it here, but it's also pretty hard. Like how you can celebrate uh, something which is so large, so huge, and just everywhere, and so diverse. And so uh, we were lucky that we found a few panelists who each know some part of the overall Linux ecosystem. And I'm really grateful that they accepted to be on a panel and tell us something about like their areas of Linux. So this unfortunately won't be the full history of Linux, which might take a little bit more than 20 minutes, but it will be hopefully at least something interesting for you. So thank you for being here. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, uh, I'm Vitaly. I am from virtualization engineering team at Red Hat, and I work mostly on uh, Linux kernel, taking care of Linux as guest on uh, various hypervisors, as well as KVM hypervisor in Linux kernel. Uh, hi, I'm Michal. I work in Plumber's team, Core Services Group, and I work mostly on SystemD and other low-level user space uh, components of the operating system. I'm Veronica. I'm the CKI tech lead, and uh, for those who don't know the project, uh, CKI is a project that uh, delivers uh, continuous integration as a service for the Linux kernel, both upstream and downstream. Thank you so much. So. We have very limited time. Let's jump right into that. We have Vitaly on virtualization, Michael from SystemD. Hopefully, folks have heard about SystemD. It's one of the big events. And Veronica is our master on testing, which also is a big thing. Vitaly, can you tell us what's virtualization about? Why did it happen in the past? What projects there have been? What options? How did it evolve? Oh, uh, the first was probably then project which started in early 2000 when some uh, smart guys uh, at Cambridge University uh, find a way to run virtual machines on x86 processors which didn't have any capabilities, hardware capabilities to do so back then. And it was very su successful because at the same time a small company in, called Amazon started offering their infrastructure as a service uh, something which is now called uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, it, it was fairly small, and they took the technology which was there and started providing virtual machines on Linux. And that's actually how Linux conquered the world. Um, and then uh, shortly after, KVM project got started when hardware vendors were already uh, providing some hardware capabilities. The idea was to, uh, contrary to Zen, instead of rewriting the whole operating system just for virtualization proper, uh, purposes, just take Linux, which had almost everything, and uh, just add missing capabilities there. And this project was fairly successful, and uh, over the years, it basically took over. So nowadays, all major hyperscalers, they run KVM underneath. Uh, only Microsoft doesn't, their Azure runs on their own hypervisor. Uh, so uh, nowadays, even uh, if you go to Amazon Web Services and you're running some very old instance type and it, Linux tells you that it's running on Zen, don't blindly trust it because uh, there is an emulation layer in KVM which uh, allows to uh, KVM to pretend that it's some other hypervisor. And in that case, uh, Amazon did the job to make KVM look exactly like Zen to its guests. So uh, here we are, and uh, the majority of world computing is running virtualized, and it's running on Linux. That's pretty cool. Uh, so where is Zen today? You mentioned KVM took over, but what about Zen? Uh, Zen is still alive. Uh, it found uh, its place in some uh, regulated uh, industries in some appliances where it's very uh, important to be able to uh, do some audit uh, of the hypervisor because KVM is part of Linux kernel and doing audit for such a huge project uh, is very hard. Then is a much smaller operating system and so it's been used there. Thank you. Let's move to systemd. That's hopefully also well known, and I think many people are aware that there used to be init scripts, which were able to boot a system just fine, and then suddenly there was a lot of talks about systemd, 
Michael, uh, Michale, can you tell us about what was that about? Yeah, we didn't like init scripts that much. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, system D, the project was started in 2008, 2009, I think. And the idea was to, you know, to, to develop a new init system or it's an init system, but more importantly, it's a service manager for Linux. And, you know, some of the developments were done on other operating systems. We, we, we saw that in, in the community and, and, but Linux had a lot of technical debt in that regard. The, you know, the system five and then init scripts, this existed since eighties essentially. So, you know, uh, the project was started, it got introduced in Fedora and, and fully integrated into Fedora in 2012. That's around that I joined the project, so I'm working on it for 10 years now, roughly. And yeah, uh, the main sort of idea was that, you know, the system started to become different in a sense that you had smartphones, you had traditional servers, desktops, so it wasn't just a computer sitting under somebody's desks for like all the time. So systems are becoming dynamic, like hardware can come and go, stuff can be plugged into machines, you know. Uh, and w one of the other problems that we wanted to address was uh, parallelism. So, you know, at that time, almost every, everybody today, and even at that time, almost everyone already had, at least uh, in the desktop, uh, you know, the CPU, which had multiple cores, but the previous software was not able to take any advantage of, uh, from this. So yeah, that, that's why we did it. And we didn't like any scripts because it, it was just hard to debug and hard to maintain. So are you saying that systemd was only addressing the problems of can we run a smaller system and can we offer the parallelism or is there more and why and how did it happen? Well, we did a bit of uh, code after that. <laughs> so um, yeah, so, so as I mentioned, the main idea was a service management. Like previously on Linux, you didn't have any service management at all. Like system five in it didn't even have any notion of like what service is. And like if you ask yourself, like why, why do you use computer? Why do you turn it on? Like especially if it is server, you know, it is supposed to serve something and you know, this is done by services, but like how you can have a system where the core component, which is supposed to manage all of these services is not even aware like what service is, like what constitutes a service. So, you know, that was one idea and the other one, since there were no, no service management, there was essentially nothing on top of which you can have an API. So we wanted to provide APIs and command line tools and sort of good user experience. So that, you know, these, these were the motivations essentially and, you know. So it eventually became like a unified interface for the Linux operating system. Yes, something like that. Like uh, that was one of the problems also that project started to address a bit later once init system was mostly stable and sort of done in big wire quotes. Uh, but we wanted to provide sort of basic building blocks for for people that want to, let's say, build a distribution or build some appliance, some embed embedded system, essentially a, a, you know, a project that provides in its system, which has a service management, but at the same time, you have a lot of other bits of, and components that you can just take, put on top of a Linux kernel and have sort of more or less complete system. Thank you. And Veronica, what about testing? How, how did it look like, like, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and why people care about testing. <laughs> it works, right? Well, you probably don't really like your machines being broken. I'm told that's not really funny if you actually have to do some work. So from the start, uh, the testing was very much community-based. You had the power users uh, grab a configuration from your, uh, their machine or something that they wanted to run, compile the kernel, boot it, and hope that everything works and report the results back. And uh, on a certain scale, this is still something that is being done. It's just being done on a completely different scale. So where you had a single user trying to, to run something on their machine, you now have, for example, maintainers with larger labs or various CI systems. And the way of the reporting is still kind of the same. It's still being done on the mailing list. Uh, just the content of the reports is different. but. This has really not changed from, from the past. 
also in the past, before we would even get to this user-based testing, you had developers and maintainers who hopefully did run some more thorough testing. Unfortunately, usually everybody had their own custom scripts that the majority of people didn't have access to, so like, good luck trying to find out what was actually tested, how it was tested, how to reproduce those failures that people find. Some of the pretty old test suits are LTP and XFS test, and to these days, these are still one of the like largest, widely known uh, test suits and still being used. But besides that, uh, the automated testing, it wasn't a thing in the past. It's, uh, well, given that Linux is 30 years old, it's like relatively recent where you have the development of a lot of different automated testing, a lot of different CI systems, and uh, it's basically just scaling out the power user. So what has changed since then? Like where we are today, you, you mentioned automated testing, and you mentioned that like we didn't have like good definition of what is the actual test case, what is the environment we are testing it. So how do you evolve where we are today? Like do we have this, do we know this now? Yes, you have a large amount of different automated tests. Uh, I did mention LTP and XFS test, but uh, now you also have KUnit, KSelf tests that are integrated in the kernel sources, so you don't even need to browse the internet to find out what tests to run. You have some of those directly in the code. Uh, we have a lot of CI systems that are running different workloads, and maybe somebody's thinking, like, why do you need multiple different CI systems? But uh, the Linux kernel is, uh, you can have a lot of different configurations. Uh, it attempts to handle a lot of different hardware. You have a lot of different workloads of, so unless you are really trying to like build a kernel with devconfig and run it in an x86 VM, chances are there is still room for more testing. Thank you. And how do current days look in virtualization and how, how it will evolve in the future? Is virtualization done, hopefully, or not yet? Uh. Well, it's never done, right? Uh, I, I think that KVM has a fairly uh, bright future because uh, currently uh, all major hyperscalers, infrastructure providers, they found this common ground in Linux and they all use KVM. They use it for different purposes like providing uh, infrastructure as a service, as well as uh, running some uh, emerging workloads, like for example, Amazon uses it to run uh, function as a service, like Lambda. Uh, it's also done on KVM. It's not going anywhere, and uh, we have uh, new uh, and exciting uh, hardware capabilities coming for virtualization. Uh, for example, uh, I can name uh, confidential computing or so-called like encrypted virtualization, which uh, makes uh, it possible to uh, not trust your cloud provider. Because nowadays, if somebody is running your virtual machine, you kind of have to trust him because he owns everything. He owns your disk, he owns your memory, he owns your CPU. And you may not want to, but in that case, uh, the only advice for you will be run it on your own infrastructure. Uh, cloud providers don't quite like it, and uh, CPU vendors came with uh, these new technologies like AMD SEV, which allows you to encrypt guest memory, SEV uh, ES, which also allows to encrypt CPU registers, Intel is working on TDX, and uh, I think that uh, it's going to be a next big thing in the virtualization in the next like, couple years. Thank you. So secure computing. Michala, what about systemd? Is it done finally or not yet? Any more changes <laughs> no, coming in? No, no, no. We are far from done, I think. Like, and it is kind of similar as in virtualization space. I think the biggest set of challenges in next couple of years will be uh, connected to, uh, to security. And specifically, the security requirements will be sort of, you know, uh, an outcome of a different deployment scenarios for Linux. Like Linux is now um, being uh, deployed in cars and in manufacturing, in in um, 
in the industry. And all of these industries has very different sec security requirements as, you know, let's say cloud provider. So, and I think, and, and because the system D is a central component of the Linux operating system today, uh, or Linux distribution, I mean, uh, you know, we will have to deal with that somehow. So, you know, we will have to deal with stuff like, how do you make sure that not only uh, kernel is trustworthy and f uh, firmware, but also you can trust the operating system itself, like systemd is, you know, responsible for decryption uh, of, of encrypted uh, devices and mounting file systems and whatnot. So, you know, we, we do a lot of stuff uh, during the boot and it would be nice if you would be able to trust that the system that you have in your car is actually what you think or what manufacturer put there, right? So that will be, that will be a, s a set of challenges. And then the second one is also related to security. Like systemd is written in C and you know, as much as we don't like it and as much, uh, you know, a lot of effort went into testing, but still we have a lot of, sec uh, we have a lot of correctness issues, memory correctness, bugs and stuff like that. So we are looking into other programming languages that could potentially address this situation or at least improve it. So maybe some of the newer components at some point will appear and will be implemented in, in Rust, let's say. But this is still to be decided, but this is something that the community is, you know, working on and this is one of the directions. So you're saying security and rewrite system D in Rust. That sounds pretty cool. Not really. I'm not. I, I don't think the you know the, the rewrite of the whole thing is is uh, something that every that anyone should try, because it's just too big at this point. Uh, but you know some of the newer components, like let's say we introduced in recent years systemd resolvedy, which is not even used you know let's say in in RHEL, and it's written in C, and you know there is very little you know reasons to keep it that way. So for example. Uh, one of the team members mentioned that maybe at some point we would like to rewrite that in Rust. So, at least for the foreseeable future, system D will stay in C, like the PID one. Thank you, and Veronica. What about the future of testing? Well, that's a really broad idea, but uh, right now I think we are in a pretty good spot when it comes to the types of the testing. Uh, we have unit tests. We have tests that are targeted to various. Uh, subsystems, for example, we have Cisco fuzzing. What I would really like to see as a different type of testing to come in is uh, more broad uh, user workload testing because uh, as we know, we don't break the user space and we need to find the issues before the users hit them. So I would imagine this is something that will come in. When it comes to the scale of the testing, we talked about how uh, we have a lot of combinations of configurations, of hardware, there's just no physical possibility of centralizing that testing. So we need to keep the distributed model it has right now. Uh, I mentioned a lot of different CI systems, including the one that I'm working on. Uh, we talked about uh, the email reporting of the test results, and this uh, is really difficult to track. So a few years ago, uh, Kernel CI was promoted to a Linux Foundation project. Uh, and one of the first goals that it has is to consolidate, for example, a database of tests, a database of results, where it would be easier to track uh, when an issue occurred, which test case uh, found it, uh, what happened. And uh, I imagine that this will be more widely used. Right now it's kind of in a proof of concept state, but uh, I imagine that we will make all of the results and testing more discoverable because if it's, it's easier to use a database and therefore then try to put together an analysis from freeform emails. And if we want to, and we want to make developers care about testing more, then this is really a needed change. Thank you so much. Uh, we are out of time, but I really want to say thank you so much for all your thoughts and thank you for being here. It was quick and easy, but hopefully there have been at least something interesting in, in what our panelists told us. Thank you. Enjoy that film.